So, I was at the DICE Summit last month in Vegas. It's basically an event where a bunch of gaming executives, publishers, VCs, developers, and indies get together, exchange ideas, complain about their bosses, and look for funding for their next game. Basically, it's where a bunch of business happens, both big and small. And so you have this large concentration of people talking very openly about the state of the industry. In the halls of the summit, in the bars and restaurants around it, truths are being told. It also takes place in beautiful Las Vegas, which is why I'm doing the whole poker thing. Well, that and I'm playing a lot of Bellatro. Have you played Bellatro yet? It's only $15. That's gonna come up later. So what are these people saying? Well, first of all, the dirty word at the weekend was Embracer Group. The Swedish gaming giant spent most of the past few years buying up game studios and intellectual property. And after a single make or break investment deal fell through, they spent most of the last year either attempting to sell off assets or closing studios because they weren't able to to get the price they wanted for them. Secondly, money is tight. Last year was the worst in recent memory for trying to get investment, either from publishers or venture capital firms. While many publishers are also just trying to get through this year, survive till 25 was the slogan I was hearing from publishers and developers alike. But here's another thing I learned, and this is something I've worried about for quite a while, especially given the, in my eyes, decline of AAA development over the past decade. These days, the ever-increasing cost of AAA development is a real problem because the cost of developing AAA games continues to grow and grow, and apparently that core gaming market they're selling them to isn't getting any bigger. How tenable is an industry where Spider-Man 2 costs $300 million to make, three times more than Spider-Man 1? There's a lot of pressure in the games industry right now, and some folks are playing with money they don't have. That and Bellatro. A lot of people are playing Bellatro. I'm not going to sit here and try and tell you why this is all happening and what's coming next, because nobody knows that, and anyone who thinks they do isn't telling the truth. What I'm going to do is focus on one element of this problem that I feel like not enough people are talking about, and it's arguably the most important thing about game sales, regardless of if you're buying or selling them. Let's talk about the price of games and why that might be changing the types of games we play in the future. Did you know that adjusted for inflation, this copy of Prince of Persia would have cost you $121.04 in today's money, this copy of Euro 2000 would cost $73.06, and this copy of Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth would cost you the incalculable horrors of the unforgiving cosmos. Well yes, Half-Life would have cost you $114.51 in today's money, which is still $944 less than the $1058.99 it cost me to play Half-Life Alex, but look, everything is relative. Inflation gets brought up a lot, but it's never the full picture of anything. Salaries and hourly pay have gone up, though at a slower pace. Some goods are more elastic than others, and larger market forces often have the final say. For example, the housing market. This house in Oakland would cost you about 182 grand in 1997, and adjusted for inflation, that's about 355 grand. Pretty good deal. But in reality, this house sold for last year for over 1.5 million. The cost of living in Oakland, it seems, is pretty high. Certainly too high for all of our sports teams. So inflation doesn't paint the whole picture, but it's fair to say that games and consoles in general are cheaper than they've ever been. Also, there are more people playing them, and the cost of going to market is lower because games are digital now. No need to sign with a publisher to print all those manuals and boxes. It turns out that games are one of the most elastic goods around. A cinema ticket cost twice as much as 20 years ago, but that original ticket was $10, much less than the cost of a full price game. This is likely one reason why gamers are adamant about these rising costs, because a game, while providing days, often weeks of entertainment, costs more than books and movies and music. They also require expensive machines to play them, so we're sensitive to any rising costs. It also explains the frustration with games as a service, and prior to that, downloadable content, because nobody likes spending $60 and then feeling like they're being upsold. One of the main reasons DLC, Seasons, and Games as Service have been part of the DNA of AAA games is because the rising cost of games development. The reason for that is scale and fidelity. Creating worlds, be them open world or otherwise, requires a lot of investment, 4K assets, thousands of animations that look right. The baseline of quality that players expect comes with a price tag. 
There have been a few strategies to get around this. Procedural generation of assets is common in some games where the style of gameplay allows it. Many studios like to outsource this work to companies in Southeast Asia that they don't really advertise it. And there is optimism from some corners that machine learning might be able to take some of this load. Programmers cost a lot too. With big tech also needing talented engineers, game companies have to keep their salaries competitive. They are needed not only to program and optimize the game, but to interface with the rest of the creative team on building tools. Tech artists are required to unburden artists with the more mechanical side of rendering, and then there are producers to keep all of this running, sound designers, multiplayer designers, voice actors, HR. The burn rate at many studios is quite high, and with all of these people working together to create one product, which takes a few years, I mean, that's a fairly risky business model. So, I don't know, maybe the design of these games ends up being a little bit more conservative to make sure it appeals to more players. And maybe the content roadmap has some more DLC on it to try and squeeze that little bit more out of the players who stick around. It's a situation that nobody seems happy with. Players already feel shortchanged by many $60 games and don't want to pay any more. And studios are having to spend more and more than ever to make ends meet. Alan Wake 2 sold 1.3 million copies last year. It likely cost 10 times more to make than Alan Wake 1. The trajectory isn't good, which is why outside of first-party games or titles funded by larger companies, you're seeing fewer of these games. Do you ever wonder why there aren't that many narrative first-person shooters anymore? It's because they cost a lot to make. You literally run through rooms that cost tens of thousands to design, never to see them again. You know what costs less? An online shooter where you only have to make a few maps. This is how commerce affects the games that are made. So what's the flip side to this argument? What is there to be optimistic about? Well, let's talk about Helldivers 2. Helldivers 2 costs $39.99. It's a multiplayer-focused game that you probably want to convince a few friends to buy too, which probably necessitates that dollar price. But it's also a live game, adopting much of the games-as-service stuff that many players dislike. But it doesn't feel gross or upselly at all. It feels tied to the loop of the game, and I think that $20 drop from $60 does really help to take the edge off. Hey, remember Pal World? It's still selling. Less, sure, but with over 25 million sold, that's a lot of people that have had their fill and moved on. At least until the next update, of course. Pal World costs 30 bucks. Velatro. I've played dozens of hours of this game and I bought it for $15. Quality games at low prices are everywhere now. Pacific Drive, 30 bucks. Satisfactory, 30 bucks. Return to Monkey Island, 25. Hades, 25. Valheim, 20. Pentiment 20. And of course, Patient Zero for all of this was Vampire Survivors, which was originally sold for $3. It's an outlier for sure. As we covered in the Noclip documentary, Luca made this game with a very low budget, and it shows. But many of those games are big games with lots of art and voice acting and complex programming. Players seem happy to take risks on these types of games when they cost a little bit less. When enough people enjoy these games, it creates buzz. It reminds me a little bit of when I worked at GameStop and people would grab a two for three deal on used games. Sometimes finding an occasional hidden gem was worth the risk. Right now, smaller teams with novel ideas seem to be the sweet spot for return on investment, and players seem absolutely fine with paying less for games and expecting to play them for less. A stark contrast to the $60 game worlds where even millions sold often isn't enough to recoup development and marketing costs. Increasingly, a lot of big budget games are failing to make the margins that they made before, and with that continuing, it's only going to make their design practices more conservative and perhaps accelerate this problem if players Players, aka customers, don't find these games interesting anymore. While every week we hear about these interesting games from smaller teams, be them single devs like Balatro or more modest sized teams like Pal World and presumably Helldivers 2. Look, I'm not suggesting that AAA games are dead. They are the tentpoles of our industry and responsible for much of the software business as well as the sale of consoles themselves. But with 2024 being a tricky year for investment, could the AA space be filled with more of these small team experimental projects? Could studios that traditionally make one large game with 1,000 people divide and conquer with multiple teams working on smaller, more experimental projects? You do see it from time to time. Games like Pentiment from Obsidian and Dave the Diver from Mint Rocket, an internal Nexon studio. 
But one thing is clear, players are willing to take a risk if they find a game new, interesting and exciting. But traditional big budget AAA games, regardless of how much 4K content they pump into them, are starting to feel less and less interesting.